Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome again to one of our uh, interviews in our series of interviews with the experts. I'm Malcolm Bell, I'm the Vice Chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine at Mayo Clinic Rochester here. And I have with me here today my uh, colleague, Dr. Abby Prasad, who's a professor of medicine and interventionalist, uh, who's in the Division of Interventional Cardiology here, uh, who's here to talk about PCI of CTO. So welcome, Abby. Hello, Malcolm. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for having me. Yeah. So let's uh, start with... Uh, really a pretty straightforward question, and that is uh, with respect to PCI of CTOs, what sort of patients and maybe what sort of CTOs uh, you know, should we be thinking about uh, performing? I think that's a very important question. It's a starting point. I think uh, the, it's if we understand what the purpose of intervention will be, it would be the best starting point. And really, unlike um, other interventions that we do, uh, PCIs, CTOs represent a specific group of patients where the risk-benefit ratios are quite different. And understanding the benefits they can derive are also different. The key patient to choose is one who has severe symptoms that's not controlled with medical therapy. Uh, that's the starting point, because as with PCI and any other stable scenario, really that's what we're trying to do, relieve symptoms. We cannot change outcomes uh, in terms of mortality. Uh, so a patient who is on multiple medical antianginal therapy agents who continues to have symptoms and a CTO is really the starting point. And then we have to think about angiographic and uh, other findings that may make them less or more suitable for intervention. So, of course, that's, you know, we're talking about a patient who has a uh, untreated CTO. But of course, if they've had multi-vessel disease, uh, we might often just treat the other vessels rather than the one with the CTO, is, is, is that a reasonable strategy or should we be thinking about treating the CTO up front with the other lesions? And that's again, a situation we often encounter because single vessel CTOs are not common. Most of the times we see CTOs, it's in the context of multi-vessel disease. And I think it's important to step back and look at the whole picture and decide whether surgery versus percutaneous revascularization is more suitable. That's really, in my mind, the first question. And that depends on complexity of the disease and how suitable the CTO is for percutaneous success. So if you have a patient who has a, you know, a CTO that seems very likely that will succeed and all the other lesions are very amenable and there's no other reason for cabbage, then I think C percutaneous is the way to go. Whereas if you have very complex disease and throw in a CTO, that would make me think that surgery is preferable. Yeah. And I think you know, what's held us back, at least in the past, has been the, um, the difficulty in opening these CTOs and, and relatively low success rates compared to the success rates that we enjoy with non-CTO lesions. So maybe just bring us up to date in 2022, what, what sort of success rates uh, might we expect with uh, treating CTOs? Historically, we've quoted success rates of around 70%, but actually when you look at data for the nationwide uh, registries, it's closer to 50 to 60%. Currently, uh, often you see in published papers, success rates close to 85, 90%, but remember these are operators who are doing 100 CTOs a year. In our hands, I would say the success rates are about 70 to 80%, uh, maybe just a tad over that, uh, but case selection matters a lot to get those success rates. Yeah. And, and I mean, I, I know personally that, you know, you're doing the, the more complex CTOs in the lab. So, you know, a success rate that's getting to 80% or so, uh, you know, has to be considered to be, you know, reasonably good. And that's very relevant. I think we're choosing more complex CTOs than we ever did before. Right. So in terms of this in, uh, improvement in procedural success that we've seen, um, what do you put that down to? Is it the equipment? Is it the operator? Is it patient selection or all of the above? Maybe just- I, I, I think it's all of the above, but I think number one is the equipment. I think that has changed a lot. I mean, we have much better dedicated wires. If you remember Malcolm in the old days, we didn't really have anything specific. We just used more of what we had you know, to do other PCI, but now we have a whole car of CTO dedicated equipment. So that's the first thing off which I think the wires and the quality of the wires is the biggest part and microcatheters. Uh, I think skill sets are very important. I think like anything else we do that's procedural volume and uh, institutional experience matters. And so I think uh, doing CTO intervention really at high volume centers makes a huge difference. And so in other words, adequate training 
many of us have learned uh, as we've gone along, but of course, many young fellows are now doing dedicated CTO training. Uh, and this is almost being seen as a subspecialty of PCI intervention. So, so Abby, do you, do you think every interventional cardiologist should be skilled in tackling CTOs? I don't think so, Malcolm. I think uh, increasingly the way this field is evolving, I think each major cat lab needs to have one or two, probably two, uh, if not three, uh, operators, depending on the size that they practice, who dedicate their time to doing these cases because these cases are long. The field is evolving rapidly in terms of equipment and skill sets. Um, and I think uh, just like structural has evolved into its own field, I think CTO intervention needs to be thought in the same way. And any, uh, any comments to make about tackling these as an ad hoc procedure when you first do the diagnostic angiogram, or is it something that you know, we should stop, uh, step back and, and plan a strategy and, and, and maybe walk us through what you might learn uh, and in terms of planning the procedure and what additional equipment you might need, um, you know, doing it on a, a specific day when you are focused on that CTO. Sure. Well, um, I would say that virtually all CTOs that we do are uh, not done ad hoc. We bring them back on a specific day that we uh, dedicate as a CTO day. Uh, those days we have at least two operators to do most of the CTOs. And we don't really differentiate between simple and complex when we plan our days because you never know when a simple case will become complex. So we always plan for two operators. Uh, should a CTO ever be done ad hoc? I, I could never say never because there could always be a very simple one with a microchannel that you could do ad hoc, but I would generally discourage against that because I think one has to take a very systematic approach if you want those high success rates. So maybe for the non-interventionists who, who may be listening to this, could you maybe just briefly walk us through some of the additional things that we may be you know, considering. And I'm thinking about you know, vascular access, is it uh, single, is it uh, dual access? And maybe just uh, explain what an anti-grade approach is uh, versus a retrograde and when these might be used uh, in concert. Sure, so I think planning a CTO intervention uh, is really important. And uh, by that, I mean studying the angiogram. Um, it's uh, fair to say that one should spend about 10 minutes looking at an angiogram, looking at uh, the proximal cap, distal vessel, collaterals. And that implies that uh, an adequate image has been taken in the first place. So in most labs, I think people are now aware of, you know, the importance of taking good images, long runs, not panning. Um, and eventually on the day of the CTO, we do biplane imaging to really make sure that we've understood the anatomy well. Uh, so studying the angiogram, and that uh, then allows us to plan the approach. And as you said, Malcolm, uh, there are essentially two major approaches. as an anti-grade approach or a retrograde. Uh, even though people have heard a lot about retrograde, really the vast majority of CTO interventions today, and perhaps even increasingly so, are done anti-grade. I would say three quarters, if not more, are done anti-grade. And then the question is, is it anti-grade wiring or a dissection re-entry techniques, broadly speaking? And again, the vast majority are done by wiring. And in part, that's because the wires have improved so much uh, over time. Um, so anti-grade wiring is pretty much as you would wire any non-CTO case, except it's just much more slow and painful work, uh, making sure you understand uh, the anatomy well and use these dedicated wires to travel slowly uh, through the vessel, through the plaque itself. Now, occasionally either intentionally or unintentionally, you end up in the extra plaque area. And that's really the dissection reentry because once you've entered that space outside of the plaque, but in the blood vessel itself, uh, then uh, you know there are techniques where you could make uh, a lot of headway using hydrophilic wires in that extra plaque space and then reach the distal cap and reenter either again using the wire itself or dedicated balloons to reenter. So that's the dissection re-entry technique. And these are, again, techniques that really require a lot of experience and high volume operators to do effectively. And in, this, in the same context, uh, maybe you just briefly describe what the retrograde approach. Uh, sure. Is, uh, so the retrograde approach has been around for decades, uh, you know, originally described using vein grafts, secluded vein grafts that we use to enter the vessel distally and then make a path retrogradely towards the proximal cap. Nowadays, we often use the LAD to go through sepal collaterals uh, or the uh, right coronary artery either way, most often LAD to the right, 
um, using the septal collaterals, which are often visible, but not always. Sometimes you can even just use invisible collaterals by just kind of feeling your way through the septum. And the goal here is to really reach the, the, uh, the proximal cap via this retrograde approach and then have an antegrade wire and then connect those two spaces that you have those two wires in. And ultimately the goal is then to finish the angioplasty in an antegrade fashion. I hope I've tried to make that as clear no, as no, possible. No, you, you have, and I think your people would appreciate then that when you think about, uh, I mean, everyone's seen an angiogram and seen collaterals. And I think this is where, uh, you know, the development of, you know, some really neat and very small and um, steerable wires come in because you're actually going through those collaterals, um, which, you know, decades ago, you would, you would never have uh, con you know, considered. Which then sort of brings up the question, you know, now you're working in territory that, uh, you know, we're not often working in, in, in those, you know, collaterals. You've talked about dissection and re-entry and I'm sure people uh, would wonder, well, what are the risks associated with that? So um, just, uh, you know, walk us through that. Well, obviously there's the risk of perforation. So maybe we'll just start with that and um, how often does that occur and, and, and then how would you deal with it? Sure. Yeah, it's, you know, if we think back to how we were trained, pretty much everything we do in the CTO area uh, brings some of those expertise, but doing things that we were taught not to do, create dissections and go into collateral. So absolutely. So there are unique risks. Um, of course, perforation because of the wires and zip wires and so on that we use. Uh, that said, I think with contemporary practice and scaling back, I mean, for a while, the complication rates were increasing with CTO interventions. But I think as we've understood more, I would say that the, the risk is around three to 5% at the most. And it's a, it's a range. So with antegrade wiring, the risk is actually pretty low, two to 3%. It's really with the retrograde interventions that we see the higher uh, complications. And even there, it's probably three to 5%. Uh, the largest risk, of course, uh, other than perforation is injuring those collaterals, particularly with retrograde. Um, and that's one of the reasons that we have so limited our practice to mostly doing them through septal collaterals because the septum, as you could imagine, acts like um, sort of a squeezes on those septals to prevent ex you know, extrapolation of the bleeding. So septal collaterals are the safest, but you can injure these collaterals and cause major hematomas that can be life-threatening within the septum itself. So perforations, either of the collaterals or the actual vessel are the biggest concern. In the retrograde kind of approach, the other thing is donor vessel injury. That's a big deal because you're going through a vessel that otherwise may be free of disease. And if you injure it, you could end up with uh, two vessel injury. Um, so um, we take great care when doing retrograde cases. And here again, you could have dissection, uh, embolism, thrombus of the uh, donor vessel. You know, so when we typically do an elective PCI, you know, we're expecting an extremely low uh, mortality associated, I mean, immediate mortality. Uh, what, what, is that risk increased in uh, patients undergoing PCI of CTOs? I would say not. I think mortality rates are exceptionally low. It's mostly these other complications that lead to that higher complication rate. So you can, you can deal with that. Yeah. So it brings me to the, the, the final question then is, um, what can you tell us about uh, you know, what data we have to inform us on uh, whether we're truly improving patient outcome, particularly with symptoms and, and, and maybe even survival, recognizing that you know, CTOs is a very common reason why we do not completely revascularize or uh, well, yeah, completely revascularize someone with multivessel disease. Um, so so what, what data do, do we have that you know, we can discuss here? So let's think about death and MI, the hard endpoints. Well, as everybody or most people will be aware, um, you know, in stable patients, we don't change that. And that's true for CTO interventions too. Uh, the decision uh, CTO trial showed that it was a trial of about 800 patients done in Asia where they randomized patients to optimal medical therapy or optimal medical therapy plus CTO intervention. And there was no difference in outcomes at uh, three to five year follow-up. So I think it's fair to say that we can't change so-called hard endpoints. But what we can change is symptoms. Definitely um, EuroCTO and OpenCTO registry both showed very convincingly that uh, the ischemic burden, the symptoms, both chest pain and shortness of breath can be decreased, quality of life improves. And in fact, in some patients who have depression, 
uh, you can decrease depression related to their symptoms. So I think there are several outcomes that we can think about or talk about that we can improve upon. So summing up you know, what you said then, it seems that it's appropriate to consider PCI of CTOs in selected patients you know, who are symptomatic. As long as it's being done by operators and you know, with the appropriate expertise, that we're not rushing into this as an ad hoc you know, procedure, there's something you know, with careful uh, planning. And that um, we also obviously need to involve the patient in that discussion one of the advantages in just not doing it as an ad hoc procedure, they need to understand the complexity of the procedure uh, as well as the uh, just the added risk of, of perforation. And as you say, maybe the mortality isn't higher, but obviously, you know, the, you know that, that would be a serious uh, complication that they'd have to deal with maybe over a matter of a few days. But is, is that fair? Is that the, 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 the message that you want to uh, put out there? Absolutely. I, I think these procedures need to be thought out carefully. The patient needs to be involved. And the key thing is to specifically outline the risk and benefits in terms of procedural success rates being not maybe as high as otherwise and the specific complications. But having said that, I think it's a very valid thing to offer to the majority of patients who have CTOs. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Abby. I really appreciate you sharing your experience uh, as well as your expertise in, in this area. And uh, as I said, I think it does seem appropriate that we should be selecting patients uh, for this procedure, but really does need to be done in a, an institution that is experienced and has a, uh, the appropriately trained operators. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Malcolm.